Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. It's Tuesday, October 19th. This is The Gateway. I'm Wayne Pratt. St. Louis Mayor Tashara Jones is one of a dozen mayors planning to address the racial wealth gap. The monetary piece is just one piece. When I talk about reparations, I talk about reparations and because we also have to repair the racist policies that have prevented uh, African-Americans in this country, again, from participating in the generational wealth. In just a few minutes, St. Louis Public Radio's Chad Davis reports on how local efforts could affect a national approach. There are more than 1,000 open jobs within departments of the city of St. Louis. As St. Louis Public Radio's Corinne Ruff reports, the St. Louis Agency on Training and Employment is holding a job fair tomorrow to hire needed workers. Ever since lifting a hiring freeze earlier this year, the city has struggled to hire enough workers to conduct public services like trimming trees and picking up recycling. Alderman John Collins Muhammad is working with the city to bring the job fair to his 21st ward, where unemployment rates are higher than in other parts of the city. He says it's important for the city to bring the necessary resources to apply to these jobs to the neighborhoods where residents need them the most. I don't think people really know that. The career advancements, the the real opportunities, the competitive pay, the great and excellent benefits. The job fair will take place at the Wesley House Association from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. I'm Corinne Ruff, St. Louis Public Radio. A $16 million project in Delwood is expected to create 100 jobs within a year and many more after that. The development will bring a bank, church, early childhood center, and workforce development center to Springwood Plaza by mid-2022. The Reverends Ken and Beverly Jenkins lead the nonprofit Refuge and Restoration, which is spearheading the project. Ken Jenkins says it will be a cornerstone for the area. In a black community, the church is the initial touch point for everybody. Mm-hmm. Whether you have banking problems, marriage problems, <laughs> um, food problems, util- everybody comes to the church. Jenkins was a guest on St. Louis on the Air. The 90,000-square-foot property has been largely vacant for more than 15 years. Lawmakers are heading back to Springfield this week to debate how to draw Illinois' congressional district boundary lines for the next 10 years. But as Hannah Meisel reports, a black voting rights group is the latest to file a lawsuit over another set of maps approved earlier this year by Democrats who control Illinois state government. A leading Latino voting rights group says communities in Chicago and suburban Aurora will see their voting power diluted under the new maps. Republicans are also making similar arguments on behalf of Latino voters in hopes the court will force a do-over on the maps that wouldn't be so punitive to the GOP. And over the weekend, local and state NAACP groups filed a federal lawsuit claiming Democrats' redistricting plan will disenfranchise black voters in East St. Louis and surrounding areas. They argue the new map for the Illinois House dilutes black voting power by splitting a historically black majority district between white areas. Democrats leading the redistricting process have consistently defended their maps as ones that reflect Illinois' diversity. I'm Hannah Meisel. Former St. Louis Cardinals manager Mike Schilt is not giving details on the philosophical differences that led to the team's decision to let him go. Schilt provided an emotional statement on Zoom yesterday, wrapping up his roughly two decades with the organization. I invest my heart, soul, and most of my professional career in helping maintain and be a part of being an organization that I cared more about than I cared about my own career. Schilt was abruptly fired last week after parts of four seasons as Cardinals manager. There's a growing call for reparations that would pay the descendants of enslaved Africans for the toll of slavery and segregation. For generations, U.S. policies have prevented black families from building wealth. Now, mayors throughout the country, including Tashara Jones in St. Louis, are committing to reparations. But as St. Louis Public Radio's Chad Davis reports, some wonder if local efforts will hurt a national push. When Vivian Gibson looks back at the first 10 years of her life, She's instantly transported to her home in Mill Creek Valley. 
1959, St. Louis officials demolished the predominantly African-American neighborhood as part of an urban renewal campaign. The effort displaced about 20,000 Black residents, including her family. Gibson says that forced move hurt many Black residents because they didn't own their homes and weren't compensated. Some who owned property weren't able to establish generational wealth and pass it on. The whole idea is to be able to have something that you can give to your children and that your children could build on and give to their children. That is just a very, very difficult thing to do when you can never get started. Gibson says some kind of reparations are necessary, not just to address slavery, but the continued policies that have perpetuated racism and segregation. The same policies and practices that displace African Americans from their homes across the country and widen the wealth disparities between Black and white Americans. Mayors across the country are trying to address that gap. Mayor Deshara Jones is one of 12 mayors who believe that cities could take a leading role by implementing local reparations programs. The monetary piece is just one piece. Um, When we talk about, when I talk about reparations, I talk about reparations and because we also have to repair the racist policies that have prevented uh, African Americans in this country, again, from participating in the generational wealth that many of our white neighbors have been able to participate in. Mayor Jones says her administration is still examining how a local reparations program could work, but she says it's important to address systemic inequity and housing discrimination. For example, Jones points to how North St. Louis homes are valued far less than similar properties in South St. Louis. Most of the wealth that we hold as far as African Americans is in the value of our homes. And we still know that there are identical pieces of property or identical houses that are in the 27th Ward that look the same as the 13th Ward, yet those homes are at least 20% or more devalued than they are on the South Side. But some proponents of a national reparations program say they aren't thrilled with local initiatives. William Darity is a public policy professor at Duke University. He's a proponent for reparations in the form of checks. He says the nation needs to eliminate the $12 trillion wealth gap between black and white Americans through direct payments. And while policy initiatives will help, he doesn't consider local initiatives reparations because cities don't have the money to eliminate the racial wealth gap. We estimate that this would be somewhere in the vicinity of two hundred eighty to $320,000 per eligible black American descendant of, of persons enslaved in the United States. So, I mean, as soon as you make that payment, uh, you've essentially erased the racial wealth gap. Data from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis shows that in 2019, the median wealth for white families was about $184,000. Black families had only $23,000. Darity says local programs could also lead to calls for a weaker national reparations program. He believes the best course of action is through Congress, though he's aware overwhelming congressional support right now is unlikely. But that simply means that part of the struggle is to make sure that we have a different Congress and that we have to work hard towards uh, ensuring that we get a different group of elected officials who will be predisposed towards a reparations plan. But Darity says the federal government paid the families of 9-11 victims and Japanese Americans who were relocated to internment camps during World War II. Vivian Gibson, whose family was pushed out of Mill Creek Valley, is aware of these precedents, too. She says after centuries of discrimination against Black Americans, she's glad these discussions are happening now. We're at an interesting time in history. People are more open to what has happened in our society and how to repair it or to start anew, uh, moving forward. So reparations should be on the table. Mayor Jones intends to use coronavirus pandemic relief funds to fund strategies to eliminate racial inequities. I'm Chad Davis, St. Louis Public Radio. Our David Casares edited that report. Shula Newman is the executive editor of St. Louis Public Radio, a listener-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. I'm Wayne Pratt. This has been The Gateway.
Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.